Hello, everyone. This is uh, Julian Bradley from Quantarix, and uh, thank you for joining this webinar today, where we'll be discussing the application of our ultra-sensitive Samoa technology in the context of diagnosing and treating traumatic brain injury. Uh, with me today here is Dr. Jeff Randall, who is going to be describing to you some of the challenges that are faced currently in diagnosing and treating TBI and the ways in which our technology allows researchers and eventually uh, diagnostics tests to be developed to actually help in this context. So I will now turn it over to Dr. Jeff Randall to discuss this in more detail. Thank you, Julian, for the excellent intro. Uh, today we're going to be discussing the challenge of diagnosing and treating traumatic brain injury. The fundamental issue is that traumatic brain injuries are neither well-defined nor conclusive uh, when you have it or to what degree you have it. Uh, there's a continuum from mild to moderate to severe, and it seems like a misnomer, but a mild TBI is described as a concussion, and certainly anyone who's had one or if your children have had one, you know that the word mild doesn't seem to describe it. TBI is in the news and in several different clinical settings, whether it's movie stars who sustain a, a traumatic injury, um, post-traumatic uh, post -traumatic stress syndrome from our sons and daughters serving in the military and the long-term effects from getting multiple mild head traumas uh, to the daily bumps and bruises that our infants and our young children have. We don't know how severe it is, whether they need to go to the doctor, and again, what's the long-term consequences. Certainly professional athletes uh, are in the news a lot with the NFL and um, professional sports in general. Uh, we see a lot of immediate uh, trauma to these to these players. We don't know when it's safe for them to return, and again, what are the consequences of, of uh, long-term, uh, as we've seen with the NFL. And then finally, the day-to-day day -day, uh, traumas that may occur to any individual, whether it's a car accident or some other um, tragedy. Concerns about professional athletes uh, is in the news quite often, and there are significant numbers of TBIs that occur in the NFL as well as, well as other uh, pro sports. Uh, addressing this is the uh, National Football League in conjunction with GE, who've created a health, head health challenge. Uh, the goal of this is to improve the safety of athletes and members of the military and society overall. And Quanterix specifically has won funding uh, to develop a blood test for measuring traumatic brain injuries and analyzing or evaluating the extent of the injury. Uh, currently, to date, there's no existing analytic test. So what happens now? How do we do this now? The current gold standard of TBI diagnostic is computerized tomography or a CT scan, basically lots of x-rays of your head. Uh, there's three fundamental issues that occur with this. One, there's the high cost. These things can cost up to $1,000. Uh, the risk of radiation, you're taking over 100 times more radiation than a chest x-ray, all focused on your head. And because these aren't well-defined and we don't know the extent of the trauma, uh, it, doctors are overusing some of these. Uh, one, in the case that a trauma ends up being more severe, they don't want to have a, a lawsuit later on as well as, again, they can't well define it. So they want to take every precaution to see what information we have. They just don't have the information from existing tests. Fundamentally, the CT scan only shows the physical brain injury. And it doesn't address whether it's a mild TBI or what the long-term effects might be. So how do you gauge the severity? Well, currently we're using a 40-year-old method uh, called the Glasgow Coma Scale, and this is a subjective test, and fundamentally it just does not address treatment. So how severe is this problem in society? Well, the global burden of T TBI turns out to be tremendous. There's more than 10 million documented TBIs every year worldwide, and that's documented. It's estimated there's far more that are undocumented. And of note, undocumented means untreated. And untreated TBIs uh, are showing up to have long-term consequences, and in particular, costs for health care. Uh, again, we can reference the NFL. We're seeing severe 
uh, trauma and life problems for a lot of people with sustained uh, head traumas later in life. So what actually happens? What is a TBI? Well, in a traumatic brain injury, whether it's a car accident or uh, falling down the stairs or some sort of accident, uh, trauma happens to the to the brain, and specifically cells within the brain are damaged or disintegrate. And when cells disintegrate, they release their cell-type-specific proteins, and those proteins will go into the blood. So it would be helpful to have a way of measuring these proteins in the blood as a, as a way of, the, of correlating the extent of the injury in the brain. So of interest is the protein tau and how it relates with a traumatic brain injury. When a TBI occurs, there's a large influx or increase in calcium, and that calcium causes certain enzymes and proteins to be activated, and these cleave or break down other proteins. And during that process, um, specific proteins are released into the blood and maybe can be measured. We're, we're interested in tau. And what is tau? Well, it's mainly found in neurons. It's associated with microtubules and plays an important role in the cytoskeleton, which holds the shape and structure of neurons. Uh, it's also involved in axonal transport. Uh, information, materials, and nutrients travel along the length of these of the neurons. When they're damaged, these ax when the axons are damaged through TBI, these they depolymerize. These microtubules basically start to fall apart, and the proteins that are associated with them uh, are released. And in particular, tau, which in the case of get is hyperphosphorylated, form aggregates. And those aggregates form into neurofibrillary tangles, and these are pathologic hallmarks of axonal injury. So fundamentally, tau being measured in the blood would be indicative of injury to the neurons sustained in the TBI. So if you want to measure a traumatic brain injury in sports, what comes to mind obviously is boxers. And we undertook a research study with Dr. Sana uh, Nacelius, and we looked at uh, amateur boxers. And we compared 25 healthy individuals with 30 amateur boxers, um, and we measured their blood uh, after a bout, within a week after a bout, and sometime after a rest, greater than two weeks out to a month. And what the data is showing that compared to the normal controls, there's an increase in the measure of tau in the blood from boxers post-bout. Then, and a significant change at that, significance being defined as a p-value of less than 0.05. Again, we see a significant decrease in the level of tau in the blood after the boxer has rested. So this shows in principle that we can measure tau as a relation to traumatic brain injury uh, sustained, in, in this case, in boxers. Of note, these boxes don't have a large separation between the boxers and the controls, but you should keep in mind that these are Olympic boxers. These are the boxers who have head protection. They have smaller gloves. And these boxers don't sustain the type of aggressive or damage or sustained injuries that you would get with you know, professional boxers that you see on television. So taking the concept or the principle of measuring tau in blood after a head trauma a little farther, we actually looked at uh, more to the point of what happens when you measure in hockey players uh, post a concussion. And so what we did was measure plasma tau um, preseason in 47 professional hockey players and then after they sustained a concussion. And as we see on the left, when you look at the preseason and post concussion, the, popula the ensemble population, there's a, there's a significant increase in the levels of tau in the blood. If you separate these out, uh, we were able to, after a hockey player sustained an injury, we measured their blood an hour, 12 hours, and at certain time points out through a week or two, uh, out to 10 days. And again, we see a significant increase in uh, tau levels in the blood one hour after a concussion, and then you see a significant increase. And then in general, the 
level of tau decreases after 12 or 24 hours, yet it's still significantly increased over pre-season pre levels. And in some cases, um, there's an increase in tau again as far out as 7 to 10 days. So if we segregate these out a little bit more, what we found were basically three types of outcomes that we saw in the hockey players. We see a mild, a moderate, and a severe outcome. And the type 1 mild, can, type 1 can be subdivided into a mild and moderate. And basically these both show that there's a small increase post-concussion and then return to baseline levels usually after about 24 hours. The moderate type 1 it starts a little bit higher but returns to baseline levels. A moderate seems to increase for the first 24 hours and then returns to normal or, or baseline levels, preseason levels. And the third, the severe type, starts very high, a lot of uh, tau in the blood. There's a drop-off within the first 24 hours, but these gentlemen sustained uh, another increase in tau in the blood as, as far out as a week to 10 days. And every single one of these type 3 severe were concussion severe enough where these players were not allowed to return to play until after uh, for greater than 10 days. So from this study, what we're able to see is that the plasma tau levels may serve as an additional tool and enable uh, safe return to play calls. Um, and in particular, in this study, it was only tau that correlated to return to play period, not S100B and NSC, which are other proteins that were uh, studied in this in this in this study. So I will now turn the webinar back over to Julian to give you a little bit more information about the company and the technology. And I thank you very much for your time and listening. Thanks so much, Jeff, for that uh, description of some of the studies we've done and uh, what's relevant for uh, researchers in this space. At a very high level, when you look at why biomarkers are important in this space uh, in comparison with some of these other approaches that have been used historically in the past, I want to highlight a few, uh, few things. First of all, we're looking at something that's safe. Biomarkers um, don't rely on things like x-rays or PET scans where there's radiation exposure. And that's particularly important with uh, young patients like children. Secondly, um, this is really a complementary tool. Uh, you can get in interesting measurements from biomarkers that can really help uh, in conjunction with some of the other assessments, including things like the Glasgow Coma Scale that Jeff referenced. Cost is always a, a concern, and clearly the imaging techniques that have been described are very expensive, whereas a blood-based test uh, can be very quick and very inexpensive, as they are commonly done in the ER very easily. And of course, at the end of the day, what really matters is being able to improve patient care, and that's where being able to measure these markers, either individual markers or panels of them, can really help to properly diagnose the patient and make sure that the best outcomes are achieved. When we look at the opportunity for uh, the Samoa technology, we really look at this not just in the context of traumatic brain injury, but really in general. And as Jeff mentioned, you know, this Samoa technology uh, is so sensitive that we're able to measure markers that could not previously be measured by other, any other technique. That's very relevant, of course, when measuring brain biomarkers, where measuring these markers in blood is important. Um, but there are a number of other opportunities in other areas as well. Uh, both in other fields of neurology and, and then beyond, in oncology, inflammation, infectious disease, uh, cardiology, and so forth. We really look at this like an iceberg. Uh, when you look at the number of FDA-approved tests for proteins, it's a relatively small number, less than 200. And yet when you look at the number of uh, genes coded in the human proteome, you're looking at thousands and thousands of genes uh, that code for an equal number of proteins. And that means that many of these proteins can't be measured or aren't be measured today, very much like the part portion of an iceberg that's beneath the water. And so we believe that this Samoa technology, as a platform for measuring proteins at very low levels, enables researchers to discover all kinds of new things in neurology and beyond. 
The actual instrument uh, that's used for measuring, for making these measurements is called the HD1 analyzer, and you can see a picture of uh, that on your screen. And this was uh, introduced by Quanterix at the beginning of, of 2014 and um, has been rapidly growing traction throughout the, the research space. These instruments are now found in most of the major pharmaceutical companies, at CROs, in research labs, both uh, academic and government foundations, and so on. Um, and it's also being deployed in a number of labs offering uh, lab-developed tests for, for patients. The, the uh, traction of technology obviously starts with the, the sensitivity, which is unparalleled, but it's also coupled with full automation, which makes it very, very easy to use. It's very, because it's automated and sensitive, it's also very precise. And then there are a number of other features that we've built in uh, that can be relevant. For example, the ability to multiplex, uh, the ability to develop assays, and the fact that there's uh, a high throughput possible. So in conclusion, this, we believe that this technology is one that opens new doors for measuring uh, and helping to uh, contribute to the understanding of traumatic brain injury, and the future can help uh, pro provide better diagnosis and treatment for patients. Thank you all very much for your time, and we hope you'll look up Quanterix at www.quanterix.com, and feel free to reach out to us for any questions. Thank you.